Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome, welcome again to this room if you were here previously before lunch. I hope you've had a great time relaxing and eating something. So uh, my name is Alex Schleif, and I'm from a company called Zero Turnaround, and we will talk about uh, uh, concurrency in Java. Uh, sometimes, uh, not just Java, maybe we'll talk about concurrency on the JVM, maybe we'll touch alternative JVM languages, uh, but in general, we'll talk through different flavors or models of how to organize concurrency and parallel computations uh, on the Java platform. So a word about me. A word about me. Oh, here we go. So uh, I am a developer advocate at Zero Turnaround, where uh, we produce uh, developers tools for developers, for Java developers. Uh, one of the, my main responsibilities is to curate and uh, maintain the bl our content blog called Rebel Labs. Uh, you can reach me on Twitter. And again, as uh, we did on previous time on the last session, there was an app uh, for DevOx Poland where you can ask questions, uh, but there is unfortunately there were no means to answer those questions in the app. So if you if you can ask on Twitter, that would be uh, the best. There are no stupid questions, uh, so just far away uh, if you have any confusion on anything. So Zero Turnaround is a home of revolutionary tools for developers. We have two products, one Jarable that allows you to uh, reload your code changes immediately and don't waste time on redeploying, making it productive, and Xrebel, which is a lightweight uh, profiler for Java applications. Uh, check them out. Uh, that will make me happy and my employer happy. So let's go back to concurrency. And let's start with a simple question of uh, why, why do we even care? Right? Uh, Definitely, we know that writing code is not the easiest task in the world. There are problems and struggles on every corner. You forget the semicolon there. You mess up the API call here, and everything is broken. And it's uh, not that easy to reason through that. Uh, but on top of that, we try to add, add the parallel computations. We will add this complexity of uh, additional complexity of reasoning through that. Uh, and we do that bef because, well, as the Moore's law states, uh, the power, computational power of uh, transistors will double up every year. And since some time, they stopped doing that just by adding chips and everything. And they started to parallelize the hardware. So now if we want to be really efficient uh, with our computations, we need to uh, go parallel as well, just to utilize the resource that the hardware provides us. Uh, and well, uh, I have a disclaimer. So this presentation won't teach you how to write super efficient concurrent code on, on JVM. It won't make you instant god of uh, parallel computations, or won't make your projects bug free. It won't even, actually, uh, I'm, I don't plan on uh, stating anything that concrete that you can say that, yes, this is amazing, I have to do this in my project. It's more an overview of uh, the different approaches that we uh, have available on the JVM and the overview, how they fit together, how they progressed and developed over time, what is the complex picture that you want to have in, in, your, in, in your, your mental picture of how one can organize concurrency. Uh, and it's just an, it will be, hopefully, it will be a good exploratory session. So if you are a person that uh, casually spent time somewhere in the deep down in the uh, uh, source code of the fork joint pool framework in JVM, maybe, uh, maybe you will be a bit disappointed. If you just want to uh, enhance your understanding and get a full picture, that would be great. Uh, session for you. I really hope so. So yesterday I was watch watching the keynote and Hadi said uh, he said many great things, right? But one one resonated with me uh, the most. It was you don't have the problems that Google and Yahoo and uh, uh, all those web scale companies have, but uh, so you don't have to emulate those practices. But well, 
what is really great to have is to have an understanding. We are developers where we are doing software development. One of the most important things here is to understand how the issue, uh, the core of the issue is working to create a full, full picture, how to think about things. So while, yes, in practice, it's rarely, uh, it's very different from the theory, uh, and we maybe should be more reluctant to go like, to the most hyped solutions. Uh, or the solutions those uh, gigantic corporations employ. Uh, in, in, in theory, we can go anywhere in this mental experiment. We are not constrained by, by any uh, means, reality, or business needs. So that's, that leads us to the way how developers are in the same way as cats. We always need things. We need that, and we, we see shiny as this, and we love to play with technology, and, well, we like cats, easily entertained, hopefully. Uh, a bit pessimistic about estimates, but uh, easily entertained. So, well, let's explore. At the core of the problem uh, of any concurrent computation, there are two notions of, uh, that we have to understand here. So, one is that we have parallelism, uh, and one is concurrency. So, the image that you see was by Joe Armstrong, uh, when he uh, tried to publicly, on his blog, uh, explain the difference between those two. And the guy is the creator of Erlang uh, language, so he knows a thing or two about concurrency. In a nutshell, a system is parallel when, can, when it can execute multiple operations simultaneously. So, for example, as a human body, I have the parallel ability to point at things. I have two hands, I can point at them. So a system is concurrent when it is capable of executing multiple operations simultaneously, but it, not exactly, it might or might not do that. So if the organization of the system allows, if the design allows you to, uh, to do things in parallel, many things at the same time, uh, the system is concurrent. Uh, and there was an important... Uh, yep, exactly. So, as an example, with a single coffee machine and two queues, the system, in a nutshell, if provided, more, uh, provided with more resources, it would be able to serve two lines at the same time. Uh, so it is concurrent, despite the thing that the only waiting that happens, the only thing that happens simultaneously is waiting. So uh, the difference between parallel, parallel uh, computation utilizes resources, multiple resources at the same time. Concurrent computation is designed uh, to possibly utilize parallel, parallel resources. So there is a difference. And we'll go through several, during the course of this session, we'll go through several models of organizing concurrent computations. Uh, and some of them will be more about uh, parallelization. Some of them will be more about organization, uh, the concurrent uh, communication between those individual things. So I'm no Joe Armstrong, so my examples on the same thing is uh, way more down to earth. So I was really impressed with Mad Max movie. There was, was a great example that came to me, to me yesterday when I was doing this slide. So the, the whole movie is about cha car chase and fights, right? So the parallel uh, part there is the car chase when there are multiple cars chase together uh, the Mad Max. And when fighting is happening, uh, then they do it one on one, right? So this is where the system could scale more. Uh, this is where there is the possibility of parallelization, uh, but they don't do that. Uh, so fighting where chasing versus chasing I think is a great example, very vivid. I hope you remember that. Uh, so, and then we have the challenges immediately. So. Uh, at the same, the same thing, while doing these slides, I was like, oh boy, concurrency is hard. And I'm not actually writing code, I'm just creating slides to talk about through those, all those issues. And uh, the, main, the, main, the main core issue of the concurrency is that it is hard to reason about, right? We have multiple mutators, we have multiple producers of information, we have multiple consumers of that data. On top of that, we, they operate not just on their individual 
locations where they are very isolated. They operate on the shared resources like your, your object fields and everything. So you guard that with locks and deadlocks, and then the compiler comes in and optimizes your program, and you don't know what, what happens with that program anymore. Uh, because of events happen out of order, uh, and a human brain is wired to think sequentially. Right? We do this thing one, we do the next thing that, and we understand the relation between those. When there are multiple things in, in parallel happening in parallel, uh, the communication and our reasoning about that ha becomes really frustrating. So there is a famous picture about concurrency. In theory, the parallel computation and concurrent computation should behave like this. Very neat, very tidy. Every puppy has its bowl. Every bowl has a puppy, right? So we have 100% resource utilization. And uh, oh god, it's beautiful. So fluffy. <laughs> so in practice, obviously, this happens. As system gets messier, uh, some resources get out of order. The Consumers and mutators of the information stumble upon each other, and, and, and it becomes a mess. The whole notion of concurrent models of uh, different models to achieve concurrency was to limit the uh, situation uh, on the slide, how it's happening, and allow us to tidy it up. Maybe it wouldn't get back to the straight line where everything is perfect, but it would allow us to understand and isolate certain issues. And uh, every, every model of concurrency that we'll look at deals with that uh, in its own way. So we will talk through the things uh, that are on the slide. So they're organized in the neat structure. Uh, it, doesn't, it's, it is not a map. It is not a general vertical diagram where the, you see the components on the bottom power everything. It is a little bit like that, uh, but it's not rigorously correct. So at the bottom, we have threads. Right? This, is the, this is the model that we have in the hardware. This is what we, some, we or somebody else will have to deal with uh, when we, we want to parallelize our computations. On top of the threads, we add a little bit of this, a little bit of management. We throw in a team lead. Uh, we throw in some estimates, deadlines, and everything, and we have the organized threads. Uh, we have thread pools, we have scheduled threads, and everything. We increase that notion a little bit further and try to push the complexity of this concurrent computation even deep down, uh, deep further down, and we get a four-joint pool framework in Java, well, seven and eight. Seven was really different, and eight is really great. Uh, Okay, good. Um, it seems that like somebody like just uh, raising a hand. Uh, I hope I'm not confusing that. So if you have a question, uh, go for it. So on top of that, on top of the four joint framework, we have three different modules of how to organize computation, and those are not exactly. So the previous ones, the bottom three, are about organizing better parallel computations. You have resources, you want to utilize them better. Uh, you want to build a system that is easy to consume for utilizing those. Now, the things on the top uh, pursue a different goal. They want you to organize your, your, your communication between different... You, you, they want to provide you a pattern of how to organize your code to access uh, this parallel resource. So we have the pure parallelization techniques, and we have on the top, uh, in the forms of completable futures, actors and fibers, and software and actual memory, oh, those organize uh, the code uh, of concurrent computations. Right? So this is what we're going to talk about. We have uh, plenty of time to go through them, hopefully. In the December of last year, uh, I uh, wrote a blog post on uh, Rebel Labs exploring those uh, different modules of, uh, models of computation. And we had a one-question poll about like, what people use for concurrency. And obviously, well, you can go on zerotorrent.com slash rebellabs and find that blog post. I think it's called Flavors of Concurrency, uh, just as well as this presentation. 
so those people who responded, they are not a uniformly distributed sample of all Java community, right? Those are people who found the blog post, read it, and cared enough to respond to the single question. Uh, Paul, so at the top of the line, the most of the people use executor and completion, completion services, uh, closely followed by usage of bare threads, basically managing threads themselves. Uh, and we have we had plenty plenty of people who use more advanced uh, things from the diagram. So uh, you can see that the most of the people somehow sit in the bottom of that. So hopefully, when we go through those, we either understand what they are, are they looking, what they found in those uh, models, or why don't they go further. So, yeah, that's how people do that. So let's see why. So let's state a simple problem and try to whip up some code that uh, provides an answer to that problem uh, using a certain concurrency model. Then we'll see how the code looks. We will see if it's easy to write or not. Maybe we'll uncover some, some issues with configuration management, and we understand what makes each model uh, better or worse at certain outcomes and how they follow each other in development. So our problem would be we want to take a, uh, we want to take a query string, and we want to take a, a string of base URLs for different search engines, and w we want to return the first result that comes back. So imagine you have a question about uh, what is j -Rebel, and you have a list of Google, Yahoo, and uh, Wikipedia. Right? So you fire away all the computations. You fire away a request to one, two, three. And the first result that come back, comes back is sufficient. So we won't do any parsing or anything. We just want to get, get the first result. So we'll focus entirely on parallelizing the computation of, uh, possibly parallelizing the computation of fetching the results and uh, return whatever the returns the first. So, Disclaimer, the code on the slides is uh, a sample code. So if you put that into your production system, that will blow up. Uh, if you spot a typo and you have ready the rotten tomatoes and other vegetables, bear with me, it's a sample code. So we'll, we start immediately, and obviously we start with threads. We start at the bottom of this model uh, scheme, and there are very good reason for that. We all, all our programs operate on the hardware. Hardware has uh, a model of parallel computation that has different uh, CPUs. Different CPUs can execute uh, processes governed by a single operation system. And inside a single JVM process, uh, the similar analog of an uh, uh, OS process would be a thread. Right? Every thread is an isolated uh, executioner of, of some code. It can run in parallel with different. Operation system takes uh, all, the, all the hassle of uh, scheduling threads and uh, communicating between them and saying, like, uh, you thread one, please sleep, and you sleep thread two, please do some work. And it does all that automatically. So. Uh, uh, yeah, it's an isolated entity uh, where you can run a piece of computation. This uh, isolation doesn't come without any cost, obviously. Uh, every thread has its own uh, program stack uh, and counter and local variables. Everything, obviously, isolated takes memory. So if we want to spawn a new thread, we will have to uh, give it a piece of memory. You can modify that with uh, configuration options, how much you give. But uh, we, we, we will give some resources to each and every one of them. So every thread goes through a certain life cycle, which is basically very easy. The most important part of that life cycle is obviously the start method. So uh, if, we, if we look at the code uh, right here, so uh, we have this problem, problem statement that we have the get first result. This doesn't work like that well, but well, uh, we'll 
roll with me. So we have the guest first result method. It takes a question and a list of engines to query. What we declare, we declare an atomic reference result, which we will return. And for every engine, we spawn a new thread, and we start that. We, we utilize the Java 8 syntax for providing runnable. And imagine we have this uh, web services url.get uh, method just because we don't want to write all the code that does HTTP requests. Uh, we just say that this exists in the library, and that will go and get the contents of the URL. So what we, what we have here is that this program will spawn as many threads as, as there are parameters in the engine list, uh, and it will start all of them. So every thread receives a single task that I should do this uh, particular piece of code, execute that, so, uh, which is obtain the result and try to put it into the result uh, field. Uh, and then at the end, the main thread just waits until some result is available and obtains that. So very simple. Uh, who hasn't seen code like that anywhere? All good, basic stuff. Uh, uh, what, we, what, we, what we need to care about this and uh, why we had to go through this hassle of atomic reference and everything is because we, we need to provide the thread safety, safety of this code. So a piece of code is thread safe uh, when it can be accessed and executed by multiple threads and be uh, at the same time and everything will be fine and it will be still working uh, well. The biggest, say, the biggest reason why the code is not thread safe is shared memory, right? Muta mutate, but we'll shared memory that we can mutate sorry about that, is, is the enemy of, of thread safety number one, because, well, you have to synchronize the communication against that. If multiple threads will try to write the same result there, uh, one of them will win, the second one will, might overwrite the result, you, you are not sure what is happening, and you have to govern the communication. So to govern the communication between threads, obviously you do use some kind of shared memory. It doesn't have to be uh, mutable. It might be mutable. It might be provide you with atomic access. But in general, you have the options to organize the communication using those things on the JVM, right? You have objects and their fields. Hopefully, you correctly synchronize access to those objects and fields. You have Java util concurrent atomic uh, Atomic uh, objects, atomic ints, atomic uh, longs, atomic references, where you you have some guarantees uh, of the communicate. What? How is the communication happening? Uh, provided by the JVM and uh, JDK. You have queues. Usually, those are blocking queues, uh, and you can pass messages back and forth, where you can just dump your data into the database and say, "Well, next time the next thread spawns, please fetch me from the database." Not very efficient. Uh, but works as a mean of communicating between two instances, uh, two threads. Why is it complex? Why is it hard? Because the, we need to do what we need to. We need to be able to reason about how two threads see the same, the same picture, the same variables, the same uh, shared state. We need guarantees on how the communication exactly is happening, and just. Uh, we just started with threads, right? So this is the simplest model how we can model concurrency. It's a, like basically the direct copy of what hardware offers and what operation system offers uh, for you in threads. So we go one level uh, higher, and now we in the application have to deal with all this uh, communication between those. We need to uh, guarantee that they behave consistently. And this is a hard question, and it's a really, really hard job. So. Uh, obviously, with every hard job, we need a sense of direction. So imagine we are this tiny dog on this tiny horse, and this helpful cat pushes at us into the right direction. So who knows what the right direction to go to if we talk about how different threads see the shared state? Everybody knows, obviously, this is the 
specification of Java Virtual Machine, chapter 17.4, the mem Java memory model. So Java memory model, as any model, just specifies the rules and operational semantics, how different, uh, uh, how Java Virtual Machine executes your code and how it allows different threads to see shared memory. Uh, it's non-trivial, it's complex, uh, it still beats the undefined behavior of concurrent programs by, by a lot. So uh, here you have that. You have the memory model, which answers to the question what, uh, what threads see. You have the basic lifecycle. You have the means and APIs to run every thread by hand. It doesn't provide you with anything else, right? So the model where you have bare threads just gives you very basic, very basic uh, properties. The thread consumes resources. They require manual management. Uh, they require manual uh, synchronization and interruption, everything. It is very easy to spawn a new thread and just fire away this action. It might be very possible that this is exactly what you uh, might want to do uh, in different environments. Uh, not so simple to get this right and highly scalable. So if your application is a, a desktop app that has to do something in the background, you can spawn a thread. Uh, if it was a single user, that might not be such a big problem. Uh, if you are in the web application and you start spawning random threads, uh, that uh, operations people will come and find you, and they will not be happy. So uh, quick and early solution, or if you really understand what you're doing and you're creating a library, uh, like we'll see further, the different models, and you really know what you're doing, there is no other means to, to, to organize concurrency. This is the, the, bottom, the most bottom level, right? Uh, this is what you have to do. So if you don't have to do this, if you cannot use the higher, uh, higher abstractions, you go with, uh, obviously, executors. Uh, the executor operates, the whole idea is that you can provide the unified access to thread uh, configuration in a unified manner, and you can make those threads work on, on tasks. Right? Every, every, every runnable, every callable that is submitted to an executor or uh, executor service, completion service, is, is a task. This is what somebody has to do in the background. And the executor itself, the implementation, provides you with, with with the horsepower, with workforce to uh, implement the task and run that. So the API is super straightforward. You just say, oh, please execute this for me. Or you just say, please execute this for me, and you get the future back uh, from which you can get the result at the appropriate moment of time. And the code is also quite straightforward. Uh, let's go through this in, 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 in steps. So first, we have the essential part, two lines of code, where we create the execution service, executor completion service. So there is a number of utility methods on the executors class that provide you with default implementations uh, of different uh, thread pools. Right? So behi behind every executor, there is a thread pool, or like a group of threads, that are configured to accept those tasks. In a nutshell, Say, in this example, we have uh, a fixed uh, size uh, executor with four threads. So uh, the, the pool of threads will be uh, four of them. And we start submitting, we start submitting uh, questions and runnables to them. So this is quite simple. So we just specify the piece of code that we want to execute and just say, please, executor, take, take care of that. So what happens next? What happens next is that this task has to go somewhere. The threads, all the threads might be busy executing something, so, and the task still has to go there, and the executor has to accept new tasks or somehow communicate that, stop, please, I cannot do this anymore. So internally, there is a queue, a queue of work items to be, to be executed. As soon as we get to the queue, there are questions. So what, what is the size of the queue? Do we have a limit? What happens when we reach that limit? 
Do we spawn new threads? Do we uh, just say that we cannot accept more tasks? Uh, if we spawn new threads, how many of them can we spawn? Can we just go, go into the infinity and just hog all the memory and uh, come back to this uh, poor solution, not poor, but unfortunate solution with manual thread management, which is like when we do the background thread every time we want? There are questions of config configuring your executor and uh, this complexity and the inherent complexity of concurrent computation. It didn't go anywhere. What it provides you, it provides you with a common mean of uh, answering those questions. So you have a, a, a fixed, fixed size executor, you have a, a scheduled uh, executor for, for repeated tasks, you have uh, bounded and unbounded factories, how you spawn new threads or how, to, how you handle the queue. But in a nutshell, on the code level, if you are just a consumer of this model, you can just go like, just give me any thread and let me, let me care about, the con about configuring that in the future when I actually stumble upon the problem. When you have a thread, when you have a service, you just say, please do work. And at the end, you say, just please give me back the results. So the completion service contract states that it will, when the results are available and they're processed, uh, it will give it to you. So the take method here will here, the take method on the slide will block until some result is available, and then we'll get that and we'll get our string. So the code is as simple as with uh, just regular threads and uh, manual management, but it does give you guarantees and does give you an abstract, a higher abstraction. So it gives you a simplicity of the configuration. It gives you, a, in most cases, the bounded overhead on the system. It pushes the complexity away from the developers, uh, and it allows you. The, it gives you means to actually deal with that complexity later when you have problems. So when you become Google, or well, Google deals with problems of different scale. But when you become uh, dependent on how you configure this, you have the means to to do that. So a very simple API. It is a preferred approach of people uh, on that survey. Uh, most probably it would be my own preferred approach to, to, to manage the concurrency, uh, at least if I have to do something really fast, really right now, and I don't have means to, uh, in time to investigate things further. Executors, uh, safe choice. No one was fired for using executors and buying IBM. Uh, so next we go into the Hooray, 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 uh, the fork joint framework. The fork joint framework for parallel computations was added into, in Java 7. So uh, I think executors were much before that. Java 5, they definitely were there with uh, the common classes and utilities. Uh, Java 7, it was initially designed, well, at least it was publicly announced as, as designed for uh, implementing the recursive tasks. So if you have something uh, parallelizable but recursive, like, say, computing the Fibonacci numbers, where every task can be split into different same kind of tasks, then Forging Pool and Forging Framework was exactly a choice. And in Java 8, it was generalized to do all kinds of parallel computations and be really efficient at those. Uh, and that's, that's how it powers all, all our streams, uh, parallel streams operations, or uh, default async actions. So why it's super efficient and what is the main quality that makes it really interesting? It's a notion of work stealing. So behind the forgery pool, there is a thread pool, right? There is an executor, uh, executor service uh, that, is, that has some workers to produce the results for you, to compute things for you. What is interesting is that not only it manages the single queue of uh, tasks that you ask it to, to, to run. Also, every worker, every thread manages the individual queue. And those uh, workers not only just do their job, but then when they see that, oh, I could do some work, but I have none, they go and find other workers they can help, which is really important because uh, it allows you to parallelize your computation much better. Right? Uh, and Forging Framework uh, works great for that. Uh, we'll see the example in a second. 
uh, but that would be a different example. So if you, if you look at the API, how you consume the forging pool, you create that or you just you use forgingpool.common, which will return you the default and pre-configured uh, forging pool on, on the JVM. And uh, you can submit tasks and you can uh, execute tasks in parallel in the background without worrying actually what, ba what is backing uh, up this computation, what are the threats that are doing that, is this actually a good idea to give this particular task to that particular thread or not. So for async computation, you have execute or fork. For awaiting results, you get invoke. Or if you just like want to submit and get the result uh, of a future type to uh, get a later use, submit. So the API are different for or in the on the on the right side, on the right side you have the uh, methods from the public API that you call from the external of the forgeing pool. Right? If you sit in the recursive computation, if you are doing the Fibonacci computation and you have now uh, two numbers to compute, you use uh, things on the right. So they will skip some things. They will better organize the work stealing. Uh, best practices between those thread workers, and it will allow you uh, more fine-grained control of how it works. So you can go with an explicit API for, 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 for join pools, and if you have recursive actions, this is probably the way to go. It's really easy to organize this co the code this way. Uh, if you don't have the recursive actions or you just want to execute an asynchronous computation uh, in a pool, you can use for example, the parallel, parallel streams. And you, in this given example, we go through the list of the all uh, engines, and we map every element. So we map every string into the result that the string serves. And we call find any to, find, uh, the f to, find, to get the first result that the string returns. So this is really bad code. Don't do that. It works. It's very, <laughs> it is very concise and readable. It does one major mistake about consuming forgery and pool. It does blocking operation inside that. So uh, the web service URL.get obviously uh, performs a web request and HTTP request to the service, and that operation will block. And that operation will block, we'll say, for the, with the default settings for half a minute. That means that one of the threads in the forgeant pool, the forgeant pool that actually powers all parallel computations in the whole JVM, uh, will sit there for half a minute and do nothing except waiting for the bytes to come back. You do that with, with a list of, say, four engines, and they all sit and wait there. That means that no other thing in the JVM can, can access those threads. So no other thing can paralyze the computations, uh, which is a really sad outcome, uh, especially if you, especially if you sit in somewhere in the application server environment. Imagine uh, you have multiple uh, web applications deployed there, and then some of them just takes and clogs all the all, all the threads, and all the rest just cannot do anything. So it's not good. Application server developers know about that. So I think it might not be true, but some time ago, the preferred solution to uh, avoiding this uh, thread clogging everything was to set the size of default forging pool to one. It means that you won't have any parallelization because there is a single thread and you just uh, execute the, all the work yourself. But at the same time, it provides you with perfect guarantees that no other deployed application would just like come and eat your resources. So uh, don't do blocking calls inside. Call small, tiny lambdas that do instant computations and return the result. For that, forging pool is impressively good. It's really quick. Startup time, everything is good. Forging pool for the win. My s probably my most favorite, my favorite way of organizing computation. Not that I would prefer that uh, in the code, but it's just really smart, and I like this work stealing thing. So the takeaways to know about forging pool, 
It's really efficient. It's pre-configured. It was written by and configured by super smart people, right? Uh, it's really easy to get right. The API is brilliant. You just provide the Lambda. Everything works smoothly and nicely. It's super easy to get wrong, especially with blocking calls, and especially because it's so often, you so often you don't know what call will block or not. You put URLs into a hash set, and here you go. It, it will call equals on the URL object. Uh, equals will go to the, uh, to the internet to check the host name, and here you go, you're blocking. And you didn't know anything. You didn't even think that that would block or that's important. So it's super easy to get wrong. If you go with Forgen pools, you can create your own, your own pools and don't actually consume the common, which is a little bit of code overhead because you have to manage this Forgen pool. You have to store that. You have to provide access. But unli un uh, un at least you will be more polite to other residents in the JVM, other pieces of code. So really cool fraudulent pool model. One of the best ways to parallelize the computation. So thread pools are backing this up. They are parallel. They map into the executor. That maps into the threads. And everything is configured. And that goes into the hardware, right? into the operation system hardware. So we achieve, at this point, we achieve a really great utilization of parallel resources. And we don't even have to configure them manually. So now we, what we go, where we go into, we'll go into the organizing code uh, to make the concurrent computation better uh, and more practical and more readable, readable. So we bravely dive into the, that's a Hoover board, actually. So they, I think they teased of building one a couple of years ago. I'm not sure if they did that or not. But obviously, that's reference to the future. And we go into complete, completable future design of the parallel computation. So a completable future is something that the code looks exact, uh, approximately like that. Let's look at that closer. Uh, the important part here is that we use the provided in the JDK uh, 8 class completable future, which represents a result of asynchronous computation. Uh, and we say that, oh, please, can you execute this piece of code in the background? And we want to return this uh, completable future back to, back to us. Uh, the good way, uh, the good, w good thing about completable futures is not only you just can say, oh, please, background. Uh, I don't want to deal with this anymore. But you get the result, uh, the type of completable future, where you can specify further uh, functionality, what to do with those responses, what to do with those results. So you can call methods like then apply or uh, then combine, and you just you provide the code, the functionality as arguments to those. And the actual execution is deferred till the time uh, w when the results are back. So complete the future illustrates using types and type system to help you organize your, your parallel code using types. Uh, by default, so uh, by default, this is backed by forging pool. It is backed by forging pool, pool common. So if you do, uh, say, complete the future supply a sync, you will know that this task will go somewhere uh, on the, on the, uh, on the forging pool. Then you obtain this complete future object, and you say, oh, then apply this function, and then apply that function. The danger here is that you are not sure where those will be executed. So if the complete future has already been completed, right? if you have the result, uh, your main thread might just uh, do the, the work itself. Right? It has the result. It has the behavior that has to be applied to that result. Let's just do it ourselves. If the result is not there, then your function, your parameter uh, to the uh, then apply, say, would be executed by the thread completing this future, right? So, for example, in our example, in our code, it went to the service, it obtained the HTML, it came back, it says completable future, here's the HTML, and completable future says, you know what, you, you really want to go, but you have to do this thing as well, and say, execute that function. So there is, 
this vague disappointment between not understanding where, where exactly and who executes that. While really convenient and uh, on the code level, maybe it's not, it's not super easy to reason about. Uh, so, but it uses types, and this is a good, good thing to know that you can do that. The next one uh, is a really good picture. So, uh, was created at the time when uh, Les Miserables was a, a new film, a new movie, and the picture depicts Martin Dersky, the author of Scala, uh, as a movie star. So, wonderful actors, uh, says the caption, and we go straight to the, to the actors, uh, model of concurrency. Actors are uh, individual entities that can pass messages between each other and execute code. So what happens essentially is that you usually restrict uh, the messages to being immutable data. So every actor uh, is multiplexed on the actual threads and the actor framework is backed by some thread pool. But what they do, they organize the shadowing uh, on the higher level. So because of that, they can do various things where they uh, stop them and pause them and run them again uh, in the way they want, not in the way the operation system or JVM handles threats. So they're much more lightweight. They can have their own isolated memory to do things. Uh, they pass messages back and forth. So say you have two immutable uh, classes of message and result, the code using actors would look approximately like this. So we omit the, the big chunk of uh, initialization code, which says that, oh, we want to have this actor system in place, and it is backed by those guys and those threads. But when you have all that, what you can just say, oh, I have this message, and uh, please, uh, this actor, execute this uh, web services URL.get. And when the result is there, just respond to your, to your sender uh, with the result object. So the whole idea is that you have those lightweight entities that you can spawn back and forth, and they communicate by passing messages between each other. So this really is a good, good, good notion about how the uh, object-oriented programming was De derived and designed to be, right? It was more about passing messages between instances rather than, well, building complex hierarchies of objects and calling everything a noun. So what is good about actors is that you can multiplex like a boss. You can have millions of actors on the, on the common hardware. They will do work. Uh, they distribute, uh, the distributed systems work beautifully because the messages are uh, usually mutable and easily serializable, right? You can spawn actors on a different machine, and you just can just throw a message there and say, oh, please just do this, and the result will come back. So it's really easy to parallelize uh, into the more than a single machine just using the same system, right? So actors will give you the ability to go forward from utilizing parallel resources of a single machine into, into larger deployments. And the really cool bit that you get is uh, supervision and fault toler tolerance. Up to this point, when we did something with, with concurrency, we always had to manage uh, exceptions and errors from within the primitives that do the concurrency, right? So a thread fails, what do we do? We have to provide the code that handles this failure inside the block. With actors, you have a tree of actors, so everyone calls somebody else, right? So we have this delegation. And with delegation, you can say, oh, you failed. You didn't get the response. You know what? Don't handle this failure yourself. I asked you to do this. I know better what, what to do with the failure, right? So you get the supervision strategies. And you can retry this message, for example, again, with a different actor, or you can time out, or you can say, I give up, and just uh, say to somebody who asked you to do something that I failed, right? Uh, Really, really good concept. A little bit verbose, at least at first, uh, but I bet like in the project, in a proper organized project, you can, you can make it work and be beautiful. It's a re really good uh, model of computation. Uh, and we get into the last one. So there are fibers, which are the lightweight threads. On the JVM, they are mostly represented by uh, quasar, by parallel universe. What they do, Instead of 
providing chunks of code that are complete, right? So usually you say, please do the work from here to here, and then you can switch to something else. Uh, what Fibers do, they, uh, or Quasar does, it instruments your byte, the bytecode of your application. It says, and so you just pass the regular code to the, to the Fiber, but instead in there, there are uh, checkpoints and continuations. So what fibers do, they execute just a little bit of your code, like maybe one or two lines of your method, and then it can go and do something else. And somebody else might like jump in on this task and finish this. So you get this uh, notion that everybody is doing progress, right? You create millions of fibers. If you create millions of threads, you will be out of resources. Even if you can manage that, the context switches and everything will be hard. With fibers, you create millions of fiber entities, and they will execute just little pieces of code. So you can say, I now need uh, like a million of computations. Please, fibers, do that. And they will go and switch, and every one of them will, will do a little bit of code, will, a little bit of work. Uh, and that's, that, that is really impressive. So uh, they use continuations. They uh, do the progress all over the place, highly scalable do bytecode modifications, so I'm not sure how it's that's applicable or not applicable to your project. But really good thing to look into. And the last one is uh, transactions. It's transactional memory, software tra transactional memory. Kind of advanced concept, uh, really easy to explain, really hard to get it right uh, in the implementation. What we want to have, there are a couple of implementations for uh, software transactional memory in the libraries, so I know. Uh, Aka STM uh, was or uh, is or was at some point uh, a working solution. Closure, uh, closure references are another one. Basically, what transactional memory does for you, it allows you to optimistically modify the memory uh, and gives you the uh, commit semantics for your writes to your, to your shared memory. Just exactly like your database does, you can modify multiple locations uh, in, in different parts of memory, and then you say, OK, now I want to commit those changes. If it, if it, if it works, it works beautifully. Uh, it propagates into memory. If it doesn't work and somebody else has modified those locations in a way that, well, your changes are now incompatible. Somebody came before you and did something. So your optimistic writes didn't, uh, didn't work. Uh, so you either can retry the same functionality, or you can fail with the corresponding message. Uh, but what you get, essentially, you get the ACID without the durability. Right? You get the atomic atomicity, you get consistency of the value of writes, and you get the isolation of those modifications. No durability because you sit in the memory, right? so if everything goes down, there is no chance of surviving. Really advanced concept, very multiple uh, theoretical research of how to organize that. Uh, uh, optimistic uh, writes something more pessimistic, how to organize that, very interesting, maybe not, not directly applicable into the, any project. So this would be the most probably complex, complex thing to integrate in your everyday project. Others are much simpler to do. So we'll go back, we go back to this uh, scheme. We looked at three, at three bottom things, thread uh, executors and forging pool as a means to obtain more and gradually more pre-configured environment for utilizing parallel resources. We looked at the complete future actors and fibers as fibers are kind of the same uh, thing as actors, but they just insert continuations uh, and a different implementation. So we saw some means of how to organize the code and how to, say, uh, utilize the process of writing a uh, software saying that, OK, now we use immutable data structures and immutable messages to pass between. You limit what you can do, but you actually uh, advance uh, in the way how you can reason about the concurrent code. And we looked at the, we didn't look much, but we mentioned software transactional memory uh, as a thing to check out maybe in a couple of years. So the whole this session was uh, what we tried to do. We tried to uh, take the concurrency, you know, challenges in the concurrency, and try to go through different models of organizing these computations uh, to get the, a tidier picture of the code where you spend less time debugging. There are two books that I want to recommend you. One is uh, The Seven Concurrency Models in Seven Weeks. 
by Paul Butcher. It's uh, kind of not very, not very thick. Uh, at least it's better than uh, something in 21 days. Uh, it talks about parallel architecture and how threads work and locks and how functional programming concepts can help you with uh, thinking about parallelization and concurrency. It talks about actors. It talked about uh, how data parallelism works and what data structures are better than others for, for the parallel computations. Good, really good book. And obviously, uh, the, classic, the classic book of multiprocessor programming, uh, The Art of Multiprocess Programming by Maurice and Neer. Uh, this is a thick book. It's not very easy to read. It's super, super good. Uh, it's on the Intel, uh, Intel recommended list of uh, books to read. Uh, yeah, recommended reading list. It has all the examples of code in Java. Right? So if you don't want to read, uh, you don't want to hassle your brain with doing pointer arithmetics uh, in the code examples, uh, but you want to understand the concepts better and the reason behind that, the old examples are in Java. It goes through all the things that you have to do from uh, the beginnings, like mutual exclusion. You want two threads to operate in a single memory. How can you make that happen? Uh, it goes through all the Patterson locks and Lampert ticket locking, very basic and theoretical constructs, an amazing book. I think it stops somewhere, it goes through all things, that data structure stops at the software transaction memory as well. Uh, if you take two things of this session, uh, use executors, use forge and pool with care and read this book, it's a really good book. Uh, that's it. Uh, and mandatory uh, sponsor slide. So uh, if you're interested in Zero Tolerance product, you can check out the URL, uh, register the eval, try the software, and maybe get a t-shirt. Well, get a t-shirt. And uh, it really works. It's awesome. Talk to Simon Maple about that. He knows a lot. And well, contact me, talk to me. Thank you. <laughs>